Welcome to another exciting and elucidating episode of the OmniTalk Ask an Expert series. I'm your host, Dan Mazinga. And I'm Chris Walton. And we are the founders of OmniTalk, the fast-growing retail media outlet that is all about the companies, the people, and the technologies that are coming together to shape the future of retail, or Chris, as we like to say, the retail news organization that focuses on tomorrow, today. And Chris, yes, Ed. today is one of my favorite annual events. And why is that, Ed? Well, because uh, back for their annual appearance and to share their thoughts on the top retail tech trends for 2023 are Microsoft's general manager for retail and consumer goods, David Leibowitz, and fellow top 100 retail influencer and Microsoft's director and partner marketing advisor for retail and CPG, a man with a title that is so long, but it's so fitting <laughs> the for notorious all, RB. The, the, all the things that he does. Ricardo Belmar. That's right. Welcome you guys to the show. We're really excited to have you back. Um, how are you both doing today? Fantastic. Good. No. Ricardo, you holding yeah, up doing over great. there? You, this yeah, is all hat for you. No big deal. Fantastic Ricardo's to be like, here. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to rock and roll. Um, before we get started, you two, I just want to give a quick reminder for those who are watching us live on LinkedIn right now, please reach out, ask your questions of David and Ricardo at any time via the chat session window on LinkedIn to the right of your screen. And please don't be shy because- No, don't be shy. No, as this title of the talk indicates, we're going to get deep on the top are. tech trends. These are two gurus, Anne. Yes. Gurus. And they're going to tell us what Microsoft believes- I know. The future will hold in 2023. I know, right? And they nailed it last year. I we'll know. talk about their predictions last year too. I know, but they I know. Well, David, you're the you're the newbie here. I want to start with you. Tell us a little bit about you and your role at Microsoft. So my background is in retail and consumer goods. I've been fortunate to either always be a, a customer partner of Microsoft and so now find myself uh, supporting the industry, leading a team also of industry experts who kind of lived and walked in the shoes of retail and consumer goods. And that helps them drive authentic conversations about the challenges and opportunities first. Right. And then determine and layer in the right technology solutions. So we love these types of conversations, um, helping retailers and consumer goods companies unlock value. Uh, and thanks for the time today. I hope we get a five out of five on our on our predictions. But <laughs> yeah, right. Promises. So wait, so David, hold on, slow down a minute. So does that mean you're like a former retailer CPG or like what what's the what's the background here? I you like some, to say I spent a lot of time in women's footwear. So long, <laughs> long time in uh in in uh fashion apparel, soft goods, spent okay. some time in consumer goods with uh with Dell. Uh, and yeah, was always either uh, building or delivering digital transformation with Microsoft. Also, uh, former developer brought solutions to the industry, uh, sales automation, sales analytics, and um, really a great uh, marriage of both of those to, to now drive these types of conversations with, with Microsoft. With the, Microsoft took a pivot to industry, so-called pivot, a, a couple of years ago. So they were going to go deep. We're not just going to be a technology enabler. We need to be able to talk the same language and the vocabulary of our customers and partners. Well, so, David, well, you seem like the perfect yeah. guy to do that. Footwear I mean, to computers, Ann. Footwear to computers, <laughs> to developer roles, to I don't think I've ever roles, heard that before. client side roles. Yeah, I mean, you've got the whole, you've got the whole, the whole bag. Um, Ricardo, I want to go to you next. Tell those who might not know you, who are probably few, few people on this, <laughs> this point. on this uh, LinkedIn <laughs> live circle. event, but tell us a little bit about you and your background and what you do at Microsoft. Yeah, so I've been uh, working for different technology providers to the retail industry for like the last two decades or so from, you know, whether it's cloud solutions like I am today mm -hmm. to going back to on-premise solutions like managed Wi-Fi, data security, digital signage. I mean, you you, you can name it. I probably be touched it at some point right. in, in <laughs> one of those technologies. Uh, so today, you know, at, at Microsoft, I'm responsible for partner marketing for retail and CPG for the U.S. So I get the uh, wonderful pleasure of working with uh, a huge number of Microsoft partners that are doing just such amazing things with the different technologies and, and solutions they're building on our platform for retailers and consumer goods brands. All right. Excellent. All right. Well, should we get to this, Ann? I think I, we got to do I this. I think it's time. I think, okay. We got the introductions out of the way. I'm excited to get to the meat of this conversation. So for those listening and watching live, we asked David and Ricardo, just like we did last year, to put together their list of the top tech trends on which they would bet for 2023. And 
Here, if you don't remember what they were last year, here was their list last year. The top five headlines, uh, top five trends, not yes. headlines. I'm so used to saying headlines. <laughs> top five trends from 2022. Drum roll, please. AI. Yes. Low code, no code, mm-hmm. which is fun to say. I love saying that. Hybrid work tools. Yes. Retail media networks. Yeah, Ricardo nailed that one last year. He yeah. did. He really did. Props mm-hmm. to him on that one. And of course, the metaverse. So my question to you, David... What is one of the top five retail trends from 2023 in no particular order? So in no particular, and it's interesting kind of reflecting on last year, what AI is going to be prevalent through all. But if I think first through the lens of what's the the problem that we're trying to solve first. Um, And I think also to this time of year, right? We're coming up on the holiday season. What's the biggest thing I think about a holiday season? All those returns that are coming up. Right. Ah. So that's been, you know, a huge problem. Uh, if you look at just coming out of the pandemic, uh, you know, NRF said that uh, online returns uh, were about 20%. Apparel, so my former uh, industry, could be double. Now, part of that challenge is, you know, we've created that challenge. I say the royal we, we as consumers and re- as retail. So as consumers, we, you know, we've got this learned behavior uh, where the dressing room uh, that is is now our home. And so we're buying in clusters and what are called brackets, small, medium, large, because there really is no standard or in women's sizes, two, four, and six, or I'm not quite sure of the colorway and if it's going to match with my other items. So, you know, we ship all of that home and then retailers made it easy and kind of almost a race to the bottom with free returns. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, you know, that's going away. You've probably seen in recent press, you know, Zara, JCPenney, they're saying they're either going to deduct a shipping fee if you want to send it back. Some will say, well, uh, you know, eliminate the shipping fee, but you're going to have to return that item in store. Mm-hmm. Why is that? It's just so darn expensive. Uh, you know, an item uh, has uh, associated costs with customer care, um, whether it's, you know, the um, calling to uh uh, to, to the company to uh, process the return, shipping that item, right? The logistics and transportation. Yeah. Someone's got to open up that box, inspect it, see if it's quality, you know, it's going to be uh, prepped for, um, for resale. And if so, at what value? If it's apparel, they've got to hang it, they got to fold it and bag it and perhaps, you know, ship it out. Um, all of those associated costs, you know, I was reading this could be somewhere between 30 to $50 per item. Right. Um, and, you know, on items like apparel, it's just, um, it's a problem because most of that cannot be sold as new. So what are some of the ways that we can um, uh, eliminate or avoid or reduce some of those costs? We're going through some of the processing of those returns. And you think about the assembly line using AI and cognition. So rather than human okay. intervention to inspect an item and see if it still um, can be properly packaged for resale, can I use AI and cognition to inspect that item, provide a score on that, and then determine what is the next best action? Can I sell it as new? Do I have to fix it, refurbish it? Am I going to sell it off to liquidation? Um, identifying using AI for, you know, frauds uh, or fraud inspection, make sure people aren't, uh, we, you know, another problem with the industry is um, fraudulent returns, right? right. Uh, understanding, we also, we want to know how our great customers are, but we also want to understand who the abusers are so we right. can avoid those on the front so, end. Yeah, basically you want to know it's an iPhone and not a potato, Yes, right? Exactly. As an example, right? That's <laughs> the one we always love. <laughs> so, you know, if I look at, you know, AI across that spectrum, and then also things like what we call strategic revenue man- management, Hmm. Some items can be resold right away. Some, you know, there were some retailers that had a challenge with returns coming back or shipments arriving late that were highly seasonal. Mm -hmm. I can't take that winter jacket and then put it back out on on the selling floor if we're approaching springtime. So I'll need to have some financial management and AI tools to determine, well, do I liquidate that? Or is it better to kind of hold and store that item as we saw Kohl's was doing for quite some time with their late arriving shipment, mm-hmm. some of their returns. So I think it's kind of probably going back to, I guess, the, uh, you know, the 2022 uh, prediction about AI and ML. It's just another application about this, um, particularly for return logistics uh, and the returns uh, problem that's in front of all retailers. Yeah, interesting. So the common thread there in terms of how you're describing that was really technology that enables 
kind of the understanding post the return activity happening. Mm -hmm. um, for the, that's how I would describe that in terms of, you know, the good arrives at the warehouse, you understand what to do with it, you understand financially where it should go, what should happen with it. Ricardo, is there any other color you'd add to that conversation? Yeah, I think it actually just building on what you just said, Chris, you know, the why we're looking at AI and ML for this. And, and I'll tell you why I have an increasing number of partners that are building solutions around this that are all data and AI partners mm -hmm. is because they're saying, you know, the retailers have within their customer data, a way to look at that information, understand why are things being returned. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of what gets the, the, the media attention, right, is just these high return rates and what the consumers are doing. But there hasn't been as much from that perspective discussion around knowing what all this data is, can you figure out whether it's identifying the right patterns or the right propensity of a consumer to initiate a return? What can we learn about that information? And what insights can we derive from that that tells the retailer, I need to change something in the operation or in how we're offering to the consumer that'll help prevent some of these returns in the future. And that could vary by product category quite a bit. What's an example of that? Well, so, you know, if I, I'll put a parallel to the side maybe for just a minute, but even if we look in other product categories, right, there's mm -hmm. still a lot, plenty of returns driven by e-commerce transactions, right? I mean, even in something like, you know, could be home goods, could be electronics, right. uh, I, you know, some of our partners have solutions where their analysis looks at, you know, what are the reasons being given by consumers for the returns? Where's the pattern in that? And if reasons are, you know, it didn't, uh, fit somewhere or it didn't do something they expected, then maybe the answer is, lies in the product description page, where right. if we just change the product description page, we prevent people from buying it by mistake, because that's what those reasons mean, right? When those reasons are used in the return, it means people bought it thinking it was one thing, but it, they realize it was something else and not what they intended. So they have to return it. That's pretty cool. That can be done kind of almost programmatically. That's Yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, that idea, I like what you're saying there because I've never thought about that in terms of my home furnishings days. Like, yeah, if you could use AI to understand why things are being returned to then automatically update your product descriptions in a very mm -hmm. accurate way that made a difference and could be calculated over time, that would be that would be immensely valuable, I would imagine. Well, and I think that it's also important, like you're talking about David and Ricardo, just the speed at which that has to happen. Mm -hmm. Like so much money is lost in time that you being able to lean on AI or ML to help make those decisions faster, to make those updates to the product detail page in real time so that you are able to kind of recoup some of the back and forth that can take weeks for some well yeah and, yes. and humans can't do that in the online universe right. the online universe is too big right, right. there's too much products so humans right. don't have the capacity or the bandwidth to be making those types of updates it's a great right. point right all right well let's go to you ricardo for number two um what what's the second trend we should have on our radar for 2023 i think so I'm, I'm gonna go back to one of our trends from 2022 right okay. and build on that for 2023 and that's the evolution of retail media networks all right. What a shock. Uh, so All right. Doubling down. Coming, right? down. Doubling down. Yeah, we're going like double down on this one a little bit. So, so what's happened this year, right? So part of, of what we said last year is that everybody was going to want to build out a retail media network. And that's pretty much what we've seen this year. Yeah. So what uh, the, the new element we see to this for next year is that you've got brands on one side saying they want right. more reporting and analysis of what's the value of all these ad units and things they're getting in these retail media networks. That's one. You, you've also now have this push for retailers that are pretty big and, and on the brick and mortar side, integrating that in-store advertising with the retail media network. So now mm -hmm. the, the, uh, you know, the offer to the brand is not just ad units on my e-commerce side or my marketplace. It's also connecting into what's happening in store. Maybe there's an end cap display or some other merchandise and it's going to be rolled into this. And then going one step beyond that, we're starting to see media networks where they're integrating other third-party management of, of media into the same offer. Uh, and so that's making it a little bit easier for brands because what's the number one, if you want to call it complaint that we're hearing from brands now is that there's so many of these. Mm -hmm. How do I even start- yeah look at managing where I need to advertise. Um, so along with that, then a couple other things that kind of branch out of that. Uh, I'm also hearing from agencies. Uh, we have some of our partners, actual digital agencies that work with brands and, and retailers over this. They're starting to see an opportunity for on their end that says, you know, you brands need more help in managing across multiple retail media networks. Mm -hmm. Even if you think of it within a category. So today you could have the top 
two or three retailers or more in a category, all offering retail media networks. Mm -hmm. Should the brand spend on all of those or should they limit themselves right to the number one or the number two in the category? Uh, so there's some agency value that can be added there, almost thinking That's of them as an aggregator of media networks in a sense, right? Right, right. Well, fully optimizer. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's no different yeah. than the media buyers that were working mm -hmm. at the agencies before when it was TV, right. radio, print, and outdoor, you know, like now it's figuring out not only, I think the other important point to point out too, is that it's not just about where you're going to get the most return on investment from your, your media spend with a retailer, but also what we've heard from brands is like, what the data looks like coming in. Like, is it clean data right. that's coming in? Is it right. usable data or is it just a dump? And you, you know, there's all these out, out underlying like yeah. factors that are coming into play too, with making those decisions and what's going to really truly be the best data coming at the the brands from their investment. Yeah. Right. Versus just yeah. forcing me to buy into this right. network in some way, shape or form. Right. I want to go, yeah. I want to go back to the in-store piece too, but oh, David, I want to let you in here too. What, what, what thoughts would you add to this discussion? Yeah, I think so. The how is interesting. Uh, you know, touching on the why. Why? Why is it important for a retailer? And just front, I'm going to bring it back to the returns. We talk about reimagining retail. How boring is it to do a return? Right. If I have to go, it, I, I walk into Kohl's and I've done I've done returns through Kohl's. And if I have that return and I'm going to save the eight dollars from shipping it back, walk into J.C. Penney. The long lines. You stand it yeah. and you're waiting to do that return. What could the experience be changed into to make it more engaging? So we're not just waiting to return that item that I got from the holidays. It was the wrong size. Um, but I've got a captive audience if I'm a retailer. Mm -hmm. Why isn't that plastered with really engaging experiential content? Right. I'd love to see that. Yeah. And I love to see that change, especially if we want to get people, I think, you know, part of the impetus around, um, you know, the, the driving customers in store is really not just to save the few dollars on shipping, get them back in the store. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To remarket it's, them. Exactly. It's, so, it's, have, you yeah. know, Highly I have a great model where you have to sneak through the entire store. There's one way in and one way out. Yeah. Right? It's, it's an experience. How do we do that for other retails from the physical brick and mortar presence so it doesn't feel like a chore? And so... I'd love to see this, you know, the marriage of that and have it manifest on displays and make it really engaging for the store experience, CPG partnerships. I think that's the true value. Yeah, you just got me thinking of like the whole IKEA experience. Like, and like, can you imagine if that IKEA experience retail media network was lit up digitally in store? That would yeah. be incredible. Yes. Like in many more ways than I could even think about. But well, I mean, I'm curious, Ricardo, like what other what other angles to David's point? Like, what are you seeing people do in this space with your partners to you know, bring the retail media network in store. I mean, we always hear digital screens, but like, mm -hmm. what is the nuance there in terms of how people should be thinking about it, particularly for 2023, because that's the context of this conversation. Where are people placing their bets in your mind from at, in terms of activating in-store digital media? Yeah, there, there's, I think the key here is, is, the, the creativity behind it. So, you know, if we think back to the, you know, let's go back, you know, five, eight years back into the, let's call those the early days of digital signage in stores, right? Right. I think even then, if you were a digital signage technology provider, part of your pitch to the retailer was to say, you know, you, you could work with your brands and sell ad space on these screens. And we didn't call it retail media networks then. I think that's yeah, right. may, maybe sort of an interesting footnote to that, but, uh, you know, it's, which is what we're obviously calling it now. But yeah. it's the same idea. I think the key difference is there, we were talking about hanging what looked like a typical television screen you'd have in your home mm -hmm. on a fixture, on a wall, from a ceiling mount, which kind of David's point, that's still kind of boring, right? It, not, not really a nice experience. Now, screen technology is so different. It can be incorporated almost anywhere. You know, you've got cooler cases, right? Any, anything in, in think grocery, convenience store, anything that's behind a cooler door that's a piece of glass, that can be made into a screen. And it can be a transparent screen as well if you wanted it to, but still it's, it's now a, a content destination. And you can incorporate screen technology in almost any way you want now and be much more creative with it. So I think that's a key element that we'll, we'll start to see more of. And I, I see that from partners who are doing things like that uh, in, in activating those kinds of areas in the store to now be a, a content destination to build an experience out of it. Right. And, yeah. to, and to your point too, it could be the mobile phone too. I mean, yep. in a lot of ways, in yeah, you can incorporate, that's right. You can incorporate way, your phones. Right? Yeah. So. Shelf edge. I mean, Shelf, yeah. We're starting to see shelf edge. labels, that mm -hmm. kind of thing too. Mm -hmm. Like, yep. Electronic shelf edge labels. Um, 
God, I love this content. This is my favorite, one of my favorite interviews we do all year because it's so it's so much fun to talk about these things. All right, well, David, let's keep rolling. What's number three? So number three, I, I hesitate. I wouldn't say um, call it just walk out. It's more about the right sizing of autonomous checkout. Mm -hmm. um, oh, frictionless, you know, I, I think you said that. It, there isn't a silver bullet. There isn't a single no. silver bullet for all, you know. Um, recently, you know, made press, Wegmans decided to discontinue their self-checkout app, right? And they were saying, well, or there were assumptions that it was due to, you know, possibly uh, a lot of shrink or shoplifting, uh, as we call in the industry. Um, just walk out is picking up, but again, it's not going to work for all store formats, all product categories, and even all customers. And so I think what we're going to see is this right sizing for the right solution for the right product for the right customer. And some, it may be a hybrid within the store. Yep. So is that right mean? store experience design too, right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. How your business model works in store. I've seen just walk out work, super small format, right? We've probably we've seen them pop up in, in the airport um, mm -hmm. kiosks, like little convenience stores. Um, they don't have to stock up with a lot of labor and it's, fairly simple to scan and go. Doing that in a big box, you know, the Costco or Home Depot, probably not. But we think about possibly reformatting, is it a potentially one or two key aisles, key, you know, specific types of products that I'd use for just walk out and perhaps other types of technology that I'd use to enable, you know, a right sizing of an autonomous just walk out experience. Like, um, you know, the, the chainsaw from Home Depot that doesn't unlock, you know, without the key, without basically right. a digital hasp. Um, so it makes it easy for me to pick up, but it makes sure that uh, I, I've taken care of the loss prevention or the shoplifting aspect of it. Um, so I think it's going to be a mix between whether I drop things in my basket, whether it's customers who want to do a kind of a scan um, at the end of the, the shopping trip, mm -hmm. which even now, you know, starting to hear some grumblings that even that becomes a little bit of a challenge. Like, yeah. I'm not an employee of the store. Why, why should I feel like I have to do that? So I think it's, it's going to be a mix. Um, the other part of it is we, we want to make sure that we still have that surprise and delight experience in the store. Mm -hmm. And how we do that when customers walking through the store, whether they're surprised and delight by some of the shelf edge you mentioned, um, perhaps by trusted advisors in the store. Mm -hmm. And so how do I get to this kind of, the, the whole experience has to be right sized, whether it's point of sale as an actual register I scan, whether it's the point of sale as the basket that I'm carrying, whether this is the point of sale, it's my phone. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be interesting to see how that unfolds. I think it's going to be very interesting in the larger store formats. That, that's going to be a problem that needs to be tackled. And I'll tell you, there's a single silver bullet, but that's going to be really exciting. David, I'm curious, especially with your apparel background, what your thoughts are on that particular vertical. Like, what do you think mm -hmm. about apparel and just walk out technology? Like, do you think we're going to start to see more expansion of a scan and go concept in apparel? Because it, it that that has kind of been like, falling behind the convenience stores, the, the things that you mentioned in the airport, like that kind of setup? Um, I would like to, the difference with apparel is there's always, the, there's an aspect where we like to try it on and we like to try it on. We like to also see how it fits with the other items in, in our wardrobe. Yeah. Um, I think of just walk out as we, it's, it's more about the experience of, I don't have to wait in line. I don't want to have to wait in line after this whole process, this yes. engaging experience. I don't want to add another 15 minutes to my trip. Yep just to wait in line and check out. If I can do that on a device, I'm sorry, you know, I walked into the Nike experience store in, uh, in Manhattan a couple of weeks ago. You know what their point of sale was? It was basically just a desk. Yeah. You, you walk up, here's a bag and you scan out with, you know, with your mobile app. Yeah. So, and I think it works for them. You know, yeah. I'm gonna pick up some shoes, I'm gonna grab a, a sport jacket, put it in a bag and, and I'm done. So and there's certain, circumstances with certain categories. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that's going to, that's a good point too, about the cash wrap. Like, I think that's another part of like, we went to Zara this summer yeah. and saw how they're doing it. 
you know, one, you have the tag removal. That's, that's the security tag common removal. That's going to be common in apparel. But I also do think that there is kind of this, like this missing component of like the place where you can fold your 100%. stuff up and put it in there. Like it is very much like I'm imagining what David's saying, where you're just like kind of jamming some stuff in a bag. Cause you're and trying to hold your phone at the same time. Like that's still the infrastructural changes like you're, you were alluding to earlier, Chris, still need to be made to support that. And that's still a problem in grocery too, mm-hmm. because, you know, unless you're like a, co- like I would actually argue that the Costco's and the Sam's Clubs are more akin to like the scan and go format than mm-hmm. a gro- traditional large scale grocery store. I mean, Sam's Club's had it since 2016. And right. it's because they have the controlled entry and exit point. And, and you go in and you get your boxes and you put all your stuff in it right. as you shop, right? And you're you're not buying as much. You buy a lot, but it's all in bulk and it's easily packaged. Whereas a grocery store experience, you buy a large grocery experience, you still need help bagging that, <laughs> right? You're not wanting to bag all that as you go. You know, the, the self-checkout machine, maybe, like that's a small, small purchase in terms of the number of items, but mm-hmm. the real grocery store experience is totally different. So Ricardo, let's bring you in here on this. So what do you think? I think what's interesting here is it, it starts to get into where we're separating the discussion between convenience capabilities and you know enhancing the overall experience for the customer. Mm-hmm. So when, when we first think about all, all these kind of automated checkout and just walkout tap techs and all that, it was all 100% about convenience, mm-hmm. right? Because what's more convenient than just not having to do anything to check out and walking out? That's the ultimate convenience. But that's not always what you need, kind of like yeah. the, the discussion we just had, right? Whether it's in a large grocery format or like a Costco or a Sam's Club, that's not necessarily the convenience a customer needs. The convenience you might need actually requires people a lot of the time in, in a different capacity. So I think what we, the, the new sort of the new thing I, I see for 2023 in this is that when we talk about these technologies, we're putting them into a, a tighter context around what's the appropriate format. And I think we can even see mm. certain formats where it's not just to David's point, not just one answer. You might see a mix of multiple of these capabilities in one format because you have to address different customers and different customers' needs at the same time. Yeah, and the last point I'd make too, I think, is like you'll also see the value add from deploying one of those solutions for the purposes you're talking about, creating other value for different types of customer experiences as well. You think computer vision cameras in the ceiling, you can get great synchronized pricing from that type of activity. You can get great promotions, get great in-store execution in terms of letting people know where things are out and all that too. So like there's all these different offshoots that are going to be discovered and explored as people try. I think David, the way you said it, right size, the right answer Mm -hmm. for their vertical, for their operation across the industry. Well, here's the other, here's the other why I was just going to add. Yeah. What return on value for the, for the retailer. So as we get to more of the curbside pickup, um, quick, easy and out, you know, retailers have lost the ability to drive an impulse purchase, increase basket size, we call it. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, when I store my card in something that's frictionless, uh, so I don't have to think about it, and I store it on my phone or some other device, and I'm literally just walking through the store with a basket, I feel more stuff in the basket. Mm-hmm. This one of our partners did some research around just walk out. They fill their basket 20% more. Oh, yeah. It's, it's similar to, I call it like when we gamble at the casino table and you're using chips instead yeah, of money. money. You right. use, you spend more, you bet more when it doesn't feel like it's real. Yeah. And so if the entire store becomes the impulse aisle, imagine how much value can be recaptured by retailers. That's Great cool. Point. That's cool. But I think David might have already set the record for the person that's picked up his mobile phone as an example the most in, a, in the history of Omni time. <laughs> Look out how many more times he does it throughout Good the props. show. Good yeah. props to the show. Um, all right, Ricardo, Ricardo, let's go to you next for number four. Yeah, so for, for number four, uh, I'm going to bring it back to frontline workers and mm, nice. uh, new ways of enabling frontline workers and, and enhancing their environment with technology. So this, in some ways, right, I, I kind of feel oftentimes that we say this almost every year, that this is a year when everyone's going to invest in their frontline te- workers and their store teams. But I think the the nuance here is that the type of enablement is a little different. So we're, I, I'm not really talking about uh, you know, trying to hand a mobile device to every store associate and putting some applications on there where they can look up customer data. We, I think we've all talked about that before and the use cases for that are pretty well laid out. I, I think now it's more a matter given the ongoing labor shortages that retailers are seeing, which we don't really seem to see those going away yet. Uh, there are still things those workers want and it's not always about compensation, right? Oftentimes it's about flexibility, 
which implies being able to better kind of own what kind of shift that worker wants to have and is able yeah. to work. Uh, so what about retailers putting in more technology that helps with that aspect of it? That's the kind of the, the trend I think we're seeing now where it's not just the technology that helps with the customer interaction. That's always kind of there and, and happening. But now it's what technology do we put in that makes the environment better for those store teams and for the frontline worker? So whether it's better managing their shifts and their and their time and their schedule, whether it's better managing the tasks that they're being asked to do, whether those tasks are with a customer or whether they're just you know operational in the store, it's all around that task management. And what tools are we giving them to make it easier to communicate both in a larger format store with other associates in that store or with team members in another store because they do have a customer question that they can't answer on the spot and they need access to that. So there are lots of technology solutions to address all of those things, which I think that's the new trend for 2023. It's less so about, you know, the typical clienteling kind of application that we've mm -hmm. heard about for years. This is more about making it better for the actual store employee in their day-to-day -day environment. Well, I know, and that's got to be music to your ears because I know when you're coming out of grocery shop, you're like, yes. where is this? Yeah, right? that was your big call out. Like, yeah, it was like, where was this trend? And so yeah. it's great to hear this. Yeah, it seemed like it was a category that was very much missing from the conversation. I mean, especially with, you know, we're looking at the staffing challenges that everybody's having. They need the flexibility. Those those frontline workers, you know, the people in the stores are expecting, they're comparing that job to a gig job, you know, working mm -hmm. for the same money amount of money or more mm -hmm. and the flexibility, which they just don't get in a lot of the roles that a lot of, you know, a lot of the ways that people are handling that right now. Um, David, how, what would you add in here? No, you're right. You, you actually touched on it. So the gig economy. So labor mm -hmm. department's also looking at these potential changes to reclassify right. contractors as employees. Right. And you think of these contractors like um, uh, Uber, uh, Lyft drivers, uh, potentially seasonal or shift workers, uh, personal shoppers. Uh, and so they're looking for better benefits, right? Better pay. Potentially employers may have to deliver on that. Ricardo's point, it's not just about pay. McKinsey cited flexibility of schedule is the number one for frontline workers. I want to have a predictable schedule in and advance. Yep. And, and how do I do that? So I'm not going to pick up my prop again, but if I had my phone, I want to be able to identify when my next shift is, right? And can I swap that with someone else? Um, I want to know, uh, you know, another challenge is um, for employers to provide that flexibility from a device, am I supplying that device to the employee? Mm -hmm. or are they yeah. using their own? And there are implications around that in terms of, do I reimburse or compensate that employee for the time spent on that device? And in some cases, they'll need technology solutions to turn off access after hours. Mm -hmm. So they can't check their ship and can't check on corporate communications right. so that they can avoid having to pay, say, for overtime. And as it relates to pay, what we're starting to see is um, uh, employees are looking for, um, you know, not having to wait for two weeks for a paycheck. Exactly. So exactly. once I finish that shift, some retailers are now providing either we'll pay into the shift or percentage of that. Right. Again, predictable pay, predictable income, predictable shifts. And that only happens with the right size, the right type of technology right, that the retailer is providing, uh, as well as what the, uh, you know, the employer seasonal worker has. Yeah, right, very right, right. All right, well, let's close it out. Uh, yes. Number five, let's see, David, back to you for this one. What, what's your pick here? Close us out. The, the top five retail trend for 2023 that Microsoft thinks everyone should bet on. Well, you know, it's AI and ML, but I said, you know, if we didn't go through this whole talk without saying metaverse. The you know, metaverse, it, all right. It, it, it's got to be, you know, that I, I I say it tongue in cheek. Metaverse, uh, you know, if we put the wrapper of augmented reality, mixed reality, um, AI, uh, it's just the next evolution of how yeah. retailers will connect with consumers. Mm -hmm. uh, so, kind of avoiding the, the the industry buzzword. But you saw recently Walmart entered the metaverse, right? They're experimenting with uh, you know Roblox. Um, Others are trying to reach shoppers, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, Target, Ikea, Wayfair, what, so what are the, the ways that'll manifest? Um, using augmented reality, mixed, you know, purpose to, to identify uh, 
you know, if a, an item, you know, a furniture item is going to fit within my home, you know, if it's the right colorway, perhaps as that evolves, um, you know, that might work for uh, apparel. We think this is really important for what we call considered purchases, right? The things that are not impulse buys. Uh, if you know, about 80% or 81% of consumers usually conduct some type of online research before they make a considered purchase. That's looking at an item, that's looking at the reviews, that's measuring, that's looking at the specs. And so can I go through a virtual try-on process uh, in this virtual world and make it easier when it goes full circle? Then I make a considered purchase and hopefully I reduce the likelihood of a return. So I got to ask you, because you guys brought the you know, metaverse hit the list last year too. If you remember when I, for those still with us that we, when we shared last year's list, I'm curious, last year you talked about, um, Ricardo, you guys talked a lot about the metaverse or, you know, virtual reality or AR applications for the operations, particularly mm -hmm. that that would be the leading side that we'd see anything. David, you just talked about the consumer facing side of it too. Are we still going to see that as well? Or is that going to take going a different direction? What do, what do you expect to see there in terms of, you know, the, the, the operations sides of things? Yeah, I, I think we are going to see more of that. So you're right. Last year, we did kind of highlight that there were multiple versions of the metaverse, right? There was that yeah. consumer facing metaverse, sort of an industrial metaverse, more on the, on the manufacturing side, on the operational side. And one of the things that we've seen happening, and I, and I hear this from a number of partners as well, is a, a leading use case kind of going even going into next year is around digital twins. Yeah, uh, which we really think of as a top metaverse asking. application. So mm -hmm. you think of consumer goods brands in particular, uh, but, but retailers as well, right? Lowe's already announcing they've yep. created a digital twin of their stores so they can use that to evaluate, you know, how would they change a store layout without having to actually move around the physical store and you can work within that model. So the digital twins, not just of stores, but manufacturing lines, warehouses, distribution centers, every operational aspect, that's becoming a, a pretty big, big use case. I, I think we'll see even more of that into next year. Uh, I think it's almost uh, kind of in parallel to all these various experiments, right? Of, you know, what do consumers want from the brand? Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's all the examples David Lister, right? Are different retailers trying to see how are their consumers going to engage with them mm -hmm. when they go into the metaverse? So you see these, these examples of, I'll build out a space in Roblox. We'll build the location in Decentraland. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, that should continue. I think, you know, there's no reason to think retailers won't do more of that. But I think these... Uh, operational use cases are the ones that are actually help with reducing costs in a large mm -hmm. part. And if we think about, you know, at least the way I see it and what I hear from partners as more and more retailers and brands are looking at their, their economic environment into next year, lowering costs is becoming more and more important, right? So new, new tools that help you get more efficient operationally go right to the bottom line and, and help make the business stronger. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I love that you brought up the digital twins thing too, because I mean, that is, I mean, I think the important thing for people to understand there too, is that whole concept is it's different than just a 3d virtual reality model of your store. It's actually a living, breathing digital twin of an existing physical operation mm -hmm. as it is an operation today, this very second, you can see what's on the shelf in that moment and you can coordinate the activities of people in the store level by what you're seeing at headquarters and sync that up in a new way, which is really the intriguing point behind it as well. And so and, I, yeah, yeah, and product design and development too. Right. I think like at, like the, we're even seeing that happening further upstream too. Like how are you collaborating on collections and then putting those collections in store and especially in the apparel industry in particular. But mm -hmm. what does that look like once it's on the floor pad? And what is the overall, you know, vision and inspiration and discovery going to be looking like when somebody's walking in your store? Yeah, you can actually eat what you cook in mm -hmm. a lot of ways, very much more simply and easier than ever before. All right, last word here, you guys, before we uh, kind of wrap it up and give kind of the summary of the trends, as well as maybe some thoughts that Ann and I have on my what may have not made the list that yeah. probably should have. So, David, maybe to you first. Um, yeah, I, I hope that we get our five out of five. And we're, and maybe we'll keep <laughs> these for 2024. I don't know. Um, but yeah, this, is, uh, this has been super fun and exciting. Uh, you know, Ricardo and I love talking about uh, the industry and retail in general. And um, yeah, you can always uh, reach out to us on, on LinkedIn. Uh, always happy to have an engaging conversation. Awesome, awesome. All right, so and so, so to recap, we had uh, technology that's gonna aid the returns logistics process. Yes. We had the further expansion of retail media networks. Yes. 
technology is going to help aid that as mm-hmm. everyone's trying to grapple with that as yes. Ricardo correctly identified last year, that being one of the key trends, the right, I thought I like how David said it too, the right sizing of just love walk it. out technology across every vertical in retail. Yes. Love that. Love that. That's probably my favorite one mm-hmm. actually. Frontline worker enablement was number four. And then of course the continued application of AI and ML in the metaverse. So, Anne, my question to you, what they leave out? What would you put in there? I, we just touched, we just touched on, yes. I mean, I, I think I would, there's not one thing on that list that I wouldn't be like, yes, I can definitely see, especially after thankfully having both of you kind of walk through what you're hearing from your partners um, on these technologies. But the two things that I would add would be visual search, which we just talked about last week, yeah. Etsy rolling that out. I, I hope and think that we'll start to see a lot of retailers start to embrace visual search, you know, especially from the operations perspective. Just computer again. vision in general. Yes, right? yes. Like how are you making sure that, how are you leveraging these powerful tools to help improve item information, item data information and knowing what's on, your, uh, on the shelves in your store. And then the second one, would be fit technology. Mm-hmm. I think getting at, you know, what David was talking about yeah, with trend number one, like about. how do we make it so that you don't have to order three sizes of shoes when you're ordering them? Like how do we leverage those kinds of technologies to really have a lot more confidence in what we're purchasing? Um, and then future recommendations of what might work for us and really just changing online shopping behavior, shopping in size me is Brent uh, right. from volumental says like Brent that, Hallwell, yeah. that seems like that's the, the direction that we should be going in and that retailers might not have a choice whether or not to go in. Right. That's where my head was going the entire time, David, yeah. you were saying that, like I was thinking about that too. Like yeah. I, the point for me, the one that I would bring up, I, cause I, I think it's a banger list. You yeah. Guys. I thought you killed it this year. I think, I mean, I, I think it's hard to debate any of those at this point. Um, for me, and it kind of bridges number three and number four with mm-hmm. the just walk out right sizing and the frontline worker enablement. I would actually, I would actually throw, like, I don't know how to bring it up because I, you know, in terms of getting more emphasis, but I think electronic shelf labels are going to have their day in the sun in 2023. I think they're going to rapidly expand because they're going to be part of the, the just walk out expansion conversation. I think number one, mm-hmm. and then number two, they're also going to be a great tool for frontline workers to improve their efficiency as well, both for the worker in store and the third party pickers in store uh, too. So, so I don't know, that would be mine, but yeah. uh, Ricardo, we'll give you the last word here. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think those are good additions too. I mean, and, and just for fun, I, I would say that your electronic shelf labels you know, that they also tie into the expansion of retail media networks in store. They do. We talked about, which, which in point. some ways you could almost kind of paint the picture where the, the media networks are helping to pay and drive the use case for bringing those in. Yes. And then it kind of an outshoot from that then is how you tie that into whatever your autonomous store functions are and whatever you're doing to help the environment for your frontline workers. It all kind of ties together. Yeah, great point. And they help you deal with inflation in real time too, in a (laughs) much different way too, which I hadn't thought about, which I know is uh, definitely something you guys are looking at as well in in terms of some of the work your technology partners do. All right, well, that wraps us up. That was a great conversation. Excellent, you both of you. It was great. Yeah, so fun. I love this. It's my favorite, one of my favorites to do every single year. Thanks to Ricardo and David for sitting down with us today. And thanks to all of you for joining us live and posting your questions on LinkedIn. And to everyone watching live or listening in later, on behalf of all of us at OmniTalk, be careful out there.